The airport isn't exactly a trip to Disneyland, but while a 30-minute delay is sure to put a damper on anyone's spirits, try having a police dog in your face as an officer cuffs your hands behind your back. That's exactly what happened for one Canadian man as he attempted to return home after a quick trip overseas. A reaction such as this might seem excessive, but after seeing the unusual cargo that was discovered inside his luggage and the immense threat that it posed, the officers had no choice but to act. With the advanced security measures used in airports today, bringing something on a plane without anyone noticing surely seems like a lost cause. Still, even with the odds stacked against him, that didn't stop Ippolit Badanov from trying. Touching down at the Pearson International Airport in Toronto, the Ontario native appeared to be just another jet lag passenger, relieved that his half day flight from Russia was over. Yet, without a doubt, the only thing on his mind was the stowaways in his carry on. As Badanov disembarked from the plane, he could feel his heart beating in his chest. But why was he so worried? He had already gotten his cargo past Russian security. How hard could smuggling it through one more checkpoint really be? But Downov had every right to be cocky, but there was one thing he didn't consider as he approached the customs counter. Dogs. The sight of the Border Patrol canines was not a welcome one. Though maybe, just maybe, he thought, they wouldn't catch the scent of what he was carrying. He shuffled up to the customs agent and reached for his papers. Then came a bark. Then another. And another. He turned, casually, hoping they'd caught wind of something else. Then, in an instant, the dogs were on him. The canines directed their barks at Badanov's bag, and the observing Border Patrol agent quickly snatched it away. Opening the carry-on, the agents were puzzled. Inside, there was only another bag. The situation only grew stranger from there, as inside the second bag they found ten more, each one made of cloth and damp to the touch. One whiff of the heavy perfumed pouches told the agents all they needed to know. Whatever was inside was not meant to be found. Taking the bags into the examination room, the agents assumed they'd contain the standard international contraband, drugs. But when they finally opened the small pouches, what they found inside instantly made them regret stopping Badanov in the first place. Leeches. Thousands and thousands of them, all alive and squirming. Badanov was immediately arrested, though the nature of his crime couldn't be confirmed just yet. While his method of transport had certainly been suspect, the agents weren't sure these leeches were illegally imported. They looked to experts for the answer, namely those at the Royal Ontario Museum and the American Museum of Natural History. Using state-of-the-art technology, the zoologist here could analyze the leeches' stomach contents to determine what species they were and whether they were caught or bred. And in no time, Sebastian Kvist, curator of invertebrate zoology at the Royal Ontario Museum, could identify the creatures as Herudo verbana, a kind of medicinal leech. Yet, while several types of leeches are used for such purposes, this specific breed was an endangered species. For centuries, Herudo verbana had been harvested and used to cure all manner of ailments, ranging from serious disease to male pattern baldness. The earliest recorded use of medicinal leeches can be found in notes 8th century BCE of Indian physicians Karaka and Sushruta. Medical leeches then made their way to the Western world by the 2nd century and were quickly made popular by the Greco-Roman physician Galen. His advocacy for the bleeding of patients was well received, and the practice became so commonplace that physicians were often referred to as leeches. Bloodletting eventually became a standard means of preventing infection and treating illness across the globe, especially in places like Eastern Europe and the Americas. During the early 19th century, it's believed that 6 million leeches were used to draw 300,000 liters of blood in Paris alone. Though leeching has fallen out of favor with most of the developed world, there are still those willing to pay a pretty penny for the slippery creature. On the open market, Haruto Verbana can sell for between $6 and $14 a piece. Given the nearly 5,000 leeches Bodanoff was caught with, it's likely the amateur smuggler was banking on a pretty nice payday. But after violating Canada's zero tolerance policy on the sale of exploited animals, he quickly found his pockets much lighter. Bodanov was fined $15,000 for his crime, a quarter of what he could have sold his leeches for at top dollar. He was also banned from importing and exporting for a year 
as well as possessing animals that are protected by the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. But had Bodanoff succeeded in bringing leeches into the country, their presence likely would have been felt by more than just those whose blood they were cleansing. Because leeches are an invasive species, their effect on the environment can be catastrophic. A common practice among those who leech illegally is disposing of them in a nearby body of water, disrupting the natural balance of the ecosystem. In fact, a number of European leech species have already popped up in Canadian lakes as a result of this dumping. Thankfully, quick action on the part of the Pearson Border Patrol agents prevented thousands of these creatures from inevitably winding up in Canada's waterways. Still, animal trafficking remains a major problem in North America. Texas's Rio Grande border, for instance, is no stranger to smugglers, and over the years, border agents have seen their fair share of strange cargo. But in August 2018, folks attempted to bring one particular unusual item across the river undetected. While out on patrol, two agents from Brownsville, Texas spotted three individuals lingering on the Mexican side of the river. The trio tried to look inconspicuous, but the sharp-eyed agents saw right through their charade. The officers approached, and as they did, the trio knew they'd been made. Caught red-handed trying to cross the border, the individuals hightailed it back to Mexico, leaving their possessions behind. It was a typical find for a border agent water jugs, shoes, and a few hastily packed bags. But there was one piece of luggage that the officers found themselves returning to again and again – a black duffel. Unable to shake their suspicions, the agents unzipped the bag and tossed the flap open. One peek inside told them everything they needed to know about the attempted border crossing. It wasn't a bid for a new start, it was a smuggling. And what was it that was being smuggled? Well none other than a tiger cub, likely just a few months old. The animal lay unconscious in the duffel, but fortunately it was alive. Without a moment to lose, the agents grabbed the young tiger and carried him. They then made a beeline for the nearest town, hoping they weren't too late to save the helpless cub. Feeling that a veterinary hospital wouldn't be equipped to care for such an animal, the officers took the cub to Brownsville's Gladys Porter Zoo. Hopefully, they figured the wildlife specialist there could nurse the baby tiger back to health. The cub was out cold when the zoo's medical team finally got him onto the exam table, and they feared that the smugglers might have drugged the animal to sedate him for the trip. Luckily, they could stabilize him, and the little guy soon came too. Not long after word of the cub's discovery got out, Border Patrol Communications Director Irma Champa reported the tiger was doing great and was expected to make a full recovery. Once healed, the cub would be placed in a zoo. But the attempted smuggling of tiger cubs like this one is something that the U.S., unfortunately, has become quite familiar with. All along the country's southern border, exotic animal trafficking has become an epidemic over the last few decades. The illegal wildlife trade is pretty big business, says Dan Crum, a U.S. fish and wildlife agent. The U.S. is sometimes a destination and transit point. And the border along California and Mexico happens to be one of those flashpoints for trafficking. In fact, more than a quarter of the nearly 50,000 black market animal shipments seized at the U.S. points of entry between 2005 and 2014 came from Latin America. Most of these shipments were comprised of birds and reptiles, but big cats like lions and tigers were also discovered. Amazingly, the Brownsville recovery marked the first time in over 20 years that a live tiger had been discovered at this area of the border. Because tigers are relatively large, they're much more difficult to smuggle and worth that much more money to the buyer. It's also for this reason that tigers are smuggled primarily as cubs. Many wildlife experts believe that once a baby tiger has grown past a certain point, smugglers will simply dispose of them rather than bring them to the market. By 16 weeks, cubs are too big. They're crawling and scratching and biting says Carol Baskin, founder of the Florida sanctuary Big Cat Rescue. But there's no longer legitimate secondary market for all those cubs that can't be used any longer. The fear is especially prominent in Asia, where large numbers of adult tigers are killed every year to satisfy the demands for their teeth, bones, and other parts. A highly illegal practice, these killings are primarily responsible for the Asian tiger's population significant drop to just 3,500. Surprisingly, the U.S. currently boasts the world's largest tiger population at around 5,000, according to the World Wildlife Fund. 
However, the vast majority of these animals are born in captivity, not smuggled into the country. But for every handful of tigers in zoos and sanctuaries, there are plenty of big cats being kept in unsavory conditions by private owners. Some are even showcased in cruel roadside attractions, where tourists can pay to cuddle and take pictures with them. Thankfully, measures have been taken across the country to put an end to the exploitation of animals. Following a 2017 sting dubbed Operation Jungle Book, 200 animals were rescued from this kind of abuse, including lizards, songbirds, and even a king cobra. Yet while countries around the world are making a conscious effort to stop the trafficking of exotic animals, a large number still slips through the cracks. Even in big cities like Paris, exotic creatures can sometimes go undetected for months, even years at a time. For instance, in late 2017, videos and images surfaced online of a 24-year-old man abusing a wild animal he was keeping as a pet. In response, a number of activists contacted law enforcement to see if this man and his pet could be located. An investigation soon began, with authorities using the man's post to pinpoint his location. After weeks of searching, they tracked the man to an apartment in the French suburb of noisy la -Sac. When firefighters arrived on the scene, they found the apartment deserted. However, when they further explored, they discovered a heartbreaking sight in the back room. There, huddled in a corner of a small cage, was a tiny lion cub. Judging by his size, this big cat was no older than one year. But the saddest part of it all was the poor shape they found him in. The cub was severely emaciated, and the many cuts and bruises on his body confirmed the reports that the little guy had been severely abused. Not too long after the bust, police officers managed to find and arrest the cub's owner, who had bought the animal simply to show it off online. But with the cub's abuser behind bars, what was next for the little lion? After hearing the cub's story, the animal rescue organizations Foundation 30 Million Ami and Refuge de la Arche decided to take them into their care. With their help, the little lion was transferred to Nature Help Centrum in Belgium, a rescue center known for rescuing and rehabilitating big cats. As the cub began to acclimate to this new environment, animal rescuers gave him a strong name to fit his story of strength, King. And boy, did he grow to fit his name. But as King began to outgrow his surroundings, it became time to seek out a permanent home for the young lion. And so, the animal welfare organization Born Free started a campaign to move King to his ancestral home, Africa. According to Born Free, their plan was to move King to their big cat rescue center at the Shamwari Private Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Here, King could frolic and play alongside other lions and lionesses that had been rescued. Once they'd raised enough money to fund their mission, Born Free placed the now fully grown King in a cage 10 times the size of the one he was first found in. It would be the last cage he'd ever be put in. On July 5, 2018, King took his first ever plane ride to the London Heathrow Airport under the care of Born Free's expert team. Poor King was so nervous during the flight. After transferring onto another flight, which is no easy task for a human, let alone a thousand pound lion, King was finally on his way to his homeland. One short plane ride later, and King had arrived in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. The final leg of the trip was completed by truck, with King's large cage being pulled behind it. Though the plane rides had put a strain on poor King, it would all be worth it in just a few hours. Finally, after traveling a total of 6,000 miles from Belgium to Africa, King arrived at his new home at the Shamwari Reserve. The Born Free team was nervous at first about how King would react to his new surroundings. As King stepped out into the winter sunlight, the young lion began to playfully leap through the grass. It was the first time he'd ever seen grass before, let alone touched it. Before King could continue exploring, he caught sight of his new playmates, Jora and Black, who were rescued from cruelty at the hands of a circus. They greeted King with a roar that left everyone with goosebumps. Officially welcomed into his kingdom, King took off into the brush to join his fellow lions. After a day of play, exploration, and a meal fit for, well, a king, of course, King took to the shade for a well-deserved, long overdue rest. King remains at the Shamwari Reserve to this day, living in peace and freedom.